Good morning. Uh, so so th this is a special honor for me uh, to introduce uh, probably the greatest team that science has known, uh, Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein. So um, th th their careers are somewhat legendary in medicine. Uh, Joe uh, went to medical school at the University of Texas Southwestern. Mike at the University of Pennsylvania. They both met at the Massachusetts General Hospital as medical interns. Um, from there went to the NIH. Uh, actually, Joe then left and went to Seattle. Mike, based on Joe's recommendation, went to Southwestern and then they met again in Southwestern. And they became uh, one of the incredible research teams uh, ever, the, the, the names Brown and Goldstein, I was thinking it almost seems like poetry, they go together so much. The, uh, in Dallas, it was just Mike and Joe. When you said Mike and Joe, everybody know there was only one Mike and Joe. The, um, I actually, during my years with them, asked uh, each of them what it took to hold that team together because everybody has said this is the model of team science. But actually, it, I'm not sure it's ever been repeated, even though it's the model. Uh, Joe told me it took a lot of attention and that uh, they, they were very careful. If, if anyone ever tried to give an award to one of them without giving it to the other one, they wouldn't accept it. The, um, the invitations to various places, very careful. I asked Mike what it took to hold the team together, and he said, Joe. <laughs> so uh, the science is incredible. So they started off as MDs interested in cholesterol metabolism and um, really wanted to have an impact on uh, one of the great medical problems facing us. Um, they were interested in genetics and identified the LDL receptor. Out of that came receptor-mediated endocytosis. Uh, and for that discovery, they won multiple prizes, including the Nobel Prize. Uh, but their career actually has been marked by incredible science even since then. And I, I actually think the uh, sterol um, response element binding protein Actually, the, the quality of science is probably as good or better than the LDL receptor. Uh, it certainly is interesting in identifying one of the first uh, re issues of uh, regulated intramembrane proteolysis. Um, so uh, the science continues. They've won together the Lasker Award, the Nobel Prize, National Medal of Science, um, and many, many other awards that I won't list. Uh, but Mike and Joe were a lot more than that. Uh, to the, they've been more than that to the scientific community, and they were certainly more than that to Southwestern. Um, they really uh, helped make uh, Southwestern. I, I always viewed it as Don Seldon came there and uh, really built a, a great medical school from almost nothing, and then he passed the baton to Mike and Joe and they further built it, and uh, we'll see who gets the baton next. Um, but, you know, Mike and Joe would always come to my office and say, you know, we need to do this. You know, Southwestern has to do this. And, and in, in all my years there, that what, what I had to do was never for them. It, it was always for the school. The, it was always, they, they could never accept the thesis that Harvard or Yale could do things that Southwestern couldn't do. The, uh, that, that was uh, unacceptable. Anything that any school could do, Southwestern could do, and, and they achieved that. Um, uh, and, and they put their time behind that when I had key search committees. Uh, uh, Joe actually chaired the Cancer Center Search Committee and, and Mike Internal Medicine for me, and, and so that was incredible. So, so I, 
they're a team and it's hard to separate it, but they're also different. And uh, people always ask, and, and you'll get to judge, who's a better speaker, Mike or Joe? As you'll see, they're totally different, but I don't know who's better. <laughs> the, uh, they, they have very different styles. Joe is, is, is really, um, has become the scholar of science in the biomedical community. Um, he's always, in addition to doing his own science, he, he studies everybody else's science. And I, I remember in, in uh, my younger days, I had just arrived at Southwest, I'd been there a few years, and Joe called me up and had heard about this guy, Peter Agre, who had uh, discovered this water channel. And he called me up and said, do you know anything about this? And, I, and this was years before Peter uh, got the Nobel Prize. And, and I said, sure, I, I know a lot about it. And so he said, can I come over? I, I want you to explain it all to me. So I said, sure. So what I didn't know is that before Joe came, he read every paper that Peter Agre had ever written. <laughs> and uh, he came, and there was nothing I could tell him that he didn't already know better than I knew, um, which, which was typical. And um, so, so Mike, I, I thought I'd share with you a story that uh, Mike and I worked together to uh, work on animal care at Southwestern. And uh, the uh, accreditation agencies um, basically were upset that uh, the mice that Mike and Joe used were not completely free of viruses. And uh, they, they basically wanted Mike and Joe to stop their research for a year, clean their colonies, and learn how to do real research. And uh, uh, Mike just could not accept this. Uh, he, he said, this is ridiculous. No one has ever failed to reproduce anything I've ever discovered, and I'm not going to uh, do this. And so Mike and I took on the regulatory agencies. And one of the great accomplishments of my deanship at Southwestern was to get our animal program put on probation. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to just finish up by saying one of the things uh, I miss so much from uh, leaving Southwestern were the great scientific uh, presentations that Mike and Joe gave in tandem. And, and this was a, an event that probably occurred once every other year, and, and you are about to hear it today. The, um, and so it's, it's really great to turn the microphone over to Joe. So uh, thank you very much, Bob, and it's really a great honor to, for Mike and I to be invited to celebrate uh, the 200th anniversary of this great institution. Notice the, talk, the title says Surviving Starvation, but I could actually give you a talk on surviving life in Dallas without Bob Alpern. <laughs> Alpern was, so in our 40 years or so uh, in Dallas, we've had many deans, and yeah, I think it's fair to say Alpern was uh, among the best, if not uh, the best, and we, even though we say, you said that Dallas could do anything that Yale and Harvard could do, we couldn't keep you in Dallas, so. Uh, <laughs> so we lost out on that one. Oh, but anyway, so in the talk today, uh, I want to tell you about some new, uh, a new area that Mike and I started about five years ago involving um, the ghrelin growth hormone system. And in many ways, it was stimulated by the idea that there's a changing dynamics of chronic disease in the US. And this shows you data from the CDC over the last 60 years and in, in individuals over 50 years of age. And deaths from coronary artery disease have dropped by 60%. And this is a result of, of uh, people have stopped smoking, um, blood pressure has been controlled in a way it wasn't early on, and also uh, there's a, uh, a decrease in the level of LDL cholesterol as a result of, of primarily the statins. And I will promise you that 
that you will never hear the word C, cholesterol, anymore in this talk, and that's it. <laughs> Even though this is one of the few joint talks that Mike and I have ever given where we have not talked about that particular subject. Be that as it may, uh, the decline in coronary disease due to those three factors, plus actually uh, aspirin therapy too has to be added, that has led to this remarkable 60% decrease. And uh, in epidemiologists and, and statisticians have predicted that if, if this continued um, in 30 years or so, coronary disease, if this trend continues, coronary disease would be a uh, relatively minor disease. The problem is, as you heard yesterday, obesity has reared its ugly head, and, uh, and over the same 60 years, obesity has increased uh, several fold, and that has been associated with a marked increase in type 2 diabetes. In 1960, type 2 diabetes was a very rare disease. Today, uh, 15 percent of the population over age 50 are on anti-diabetic uh, therapy for type 2 diabetes. And uh, type 2 diabetes and its insulin resistance are, are really the, the underlying cause of, of what's now known as the metabolic syndrome, which um, is probably the commonest cause of, of atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease in the U.S. today. So it's very uh, unlikely that this trend will continue unless something is done about obesity uh, and type 2 diabetes. So that is the challenge over the next uh, 10 to 20 years is to learn as much as one can learn about the pathogenesis of obesity, type 2 diabetes, in such a way that one can um, apply preventive therapy in the way one has done uh, for coronary uh, heart disease. So here's how uh, two famous artists have, re have viewed what's happened over the last 50 years. Uh, the Swiss sculptor Giacometti, after World War II, looked around Europe and this is what he saw. And Lucian Freud, the English painter, walked the streets of London 50 years later and this is what he's, what he's has seen. So there's uh, a rem remarkable evolution in the uh, human body in just 50 years as a result of, of um, the obesity uh, epidemic. So there's been a really, I think, a very important start in understanding appetite control and obesity as a result of, of two discoveries that have, that have happened uh, re, uh, in the last 20 years or so. The discovery of two hormones made in the periphery that affect uh, energy metabolism as a result of action in the brain. The first one was discovered by Jeff Friedman at the Rockefeller University around uh, 1994. Leptin is made uh, essentially only in adipose tissue. It acts on receptors in the uh, hypothalamus uh, to decrease appetite, body weight, and blood sugar. And then uh, about six years later, two Japanese scientists, uh, Koji, uh, Kojima and Kanazawa at Osaka University discovered ghrelin, which is a polypeptide hormone made almost exclusively in the stomach, and it acts on receptors also in the brain, uh, several places, one of which is the hypothalamus, and it has exactly the opposite effects of leptin uh, from pharmacologic studies uh, that I'll tell you about in a minute. It increases appetite, increases body weight, and increases uh, blood sugar. So, so for the first time, I think scientists have had an entree into uh, to studying appetite control as a result of the discovery of these two hormones and the fact that they actually work in the brain and one can now begin to dissect out what the mechanism of action of these various hormones is. And uh, there's a lot that, from Friedman's work on leptin, this led to mapping neurons in the brain. There's less work on the mechanisms of ghrelin, and that will be uh, what Mike and I will discuss today, and this is what sort of excited us about ghrelin. So, uh, so we entered the field of ghrelin fairly late. So let me give you uh, a background of what was known about ghrelin uh, up to about five years ago. It was discovered by Kojima in Kanagawa in 1999, it's a peptide hormone of 28 amino acids produced in the stomach in only about 1% of the epithelial cells. It's a, a special type of endocrine cell now called ghrelin cells. 
and it's produced as a pre-progrelin, undergoes proteolytic processing, which I'll talk about later. And, but this is an interesting aspect that attracted our attention. It's modified by an O-acylation with an octanoate, an 8-carbon fatty acid. This is the only known protein in nature that undergoes uh, a modification with an 8-carbon fatty acid. You've heard about palmitylation and meristylation. Those are uh, much more widespread and involve probably hundreds of proteins. But octanoation, uh, as of right now, the only known protein is, uh, that undergoes that modification is ghrelin. And the octanoation is essential for biologic activity as, as, dis as reported in the first um, paper announcing the discovery of Akujima and Kanagawa. There are two forms in blood. Ghrelin, when we talk about ghrelin, that we mean the octanoated form of ghrelin, the biologically active form, and then there's acyl ghrelin, ghrelin without a fatty acid. And ghrelin, but not just acyl ghrelin, acts on receptors in the brain to release growth hormone, and that's how it was actually discovered as a growth hormone releasing uh, peptide. Here is uh, ghrelin. This is a, the form that circulates in the blood, 28 amino acids, and the octanol group is attached, a uh, covalent linkage to the third uh, serine. It's highly conserved uh, in nature all the way back to fish, and uh, the octanol group is present on all species of ghrelin, and, and it's been studied uh, in fish and virtually all uh, uh, vertebrates, and the octanol group is essential for the, for the biologic uh, activity. Here's how ghrelin releases growth hormone, and this is a simplified uh, view of the subject, but for the purpose of the talk, I think it's, it's reasonably accurate. The stomach makes ghrelin, and ghrelin can release growth hormone directly by acting on ghrelin receptors in the pituitary somatotrophs to release growth hormone, or it can act indirectly on the same ghrelin receptor on the hypothalamic arcuate neurons. Uh, and there, though, uh, once ghrelin activates a receptor, and the receptor is a classic G protein couple receptor, uh, once it acts on the receptor, there's a whole series of signal transduction events that lead to the, re the release of growth hormone releasing factor. And growth hormone releasing factor has its own receptor, the GHRF receptor, on pituitary somatotrophs <coughs> to release growth hormone. This is the canonical pathway that's been studied for years and it's been in all the textbooks of endocrinology. And the signal for the release of growth hormone releasing factor uh, in the classic sense is not ghrelin. It's actually dopamine and other inputs from other neurons in the, in the brain. And this is a pathway that is responsible for growth and for the classic actions of growth hormone. And as you'll see in a moment, ghrelin, even though it can release growth hormone, does not affect the growth of, of an animal. So, so the, these two pathways uh, and ghrelin uh, works through its own receptors and, uh, and one of its, and let me just say, the physiologists who study this believe that the major way in which ghrelin is working is through this pathway here, even though this is how it was discovered. It was discovered as a, in a tissue culture model uh, on pituitary cells of culture, but the, this is probably the physiologic way in which ghrelin releases uh, growth hormone. So what are the functions of ghrelin? So here's how scientists have studied ghrelin. Uh, the first studies were the examination of the plasma profiles in animals and in humans. And the conclusion was that ghrelin delivers a hunger signal to the brain and it's involved in the initiation of meals. And this is probably the, the best study in the literature by Michael Thorne, an endocrinologist at the University of Virginia. And these are uh, uh, eight college students who uh, were put on a metabolic ward and they had three meals a day while they also went to school. And their blood was measured every uh, 20 minutes or so. And you can see that after they ate breakfast, the ghrelin level came down promptly. And then in anticipation of lunch, it went up. And then they ate lunch, and it came down. And in anticipation of dinner, it went up. And then it came down. And then when they went to sleep, in the middle of the night, presumably they were dreaming about food, <laughs> uh, the ghrelin level goes up. And then it slowly comes down, but it never comes down to baseline. And maybe that's why you wake up hungry. And then you eat, and it comes back down. 
So, so in this study, it's been repeated over and over in both humans and many animals. And so this is what led to the idea that ghrelin was delivering a hunger signal uh, to the brain. And then, uh, and then pharmacologic studies were consistent with that, uh, in which one could administer excess ghrelin, again, to humans as well as to animals, and it increased the appetite, food intake, and body weight. And I'll just show you one study, the first one, uh, actually not the first, but uh, a very nice one from uh, Kanagawa and Proud in, in Osaka, in which uh, this is the food intake in, measured in rats two hours after the administration of ghrelin. You can see uh, the food intake went up markedly. And then when they, as control, uh, administered desacyl ghrelin without the octanol group, even at, at three and a half times higher levels, there was no increase. And this study, there have been a thousand studies in the literature, believe it or not, in which uh, ghrelin has been administered to animals ranging from goldfish to cows. And in every study, one always sees this. So on the basis of the, the uh, endocrine profiles and on the basis of the pharmacologic data, it would seem reasonable to conclude that ghrelin is uh, an appetite-stimulating hormone. The problem is when scientists began to do uh, gene knockouts on ghrelin gene and the ghrelin receptor, there was no obvious effect on feeding on either a normal diet or on a, on a fat and rich diet. And also there was no effect on growth. And this is, I think, <coughs> this is a striking result because it would say that the effects of ghrelin on growth hormone have nothing to do with growth. Here, was, this was a surprise that there was no effect on feeding. And you could say these were all, have, so far, have all been germline knockouts. You could say they're, the system is redundant, there's compensation, and, um, but uh, that hasn't really been explored by doing um, more selective knockouts. But be that as it may, based on the data as of right now, there's a puzzle as to what is the normal function of ghrelin since this hormone and the octillation aspect of it is, is, is totally conserved all the way uh, to fish. So, so about five years ago, uh, Mike and I, who had been discussing ghrelin after the first paper because of this octanol modification which attracted our attention, uh, decided, because we had a great student who could tackle this problem, that we would approach the ghrelin problem through <coughs> Uh, enzymology to try to identify the enzyme, the enzyme that um, that attaches the octanol group to uh, to ghrelin. I think we're saying. Oh, here we go. And so uh, this is the approach that that we decided to take. And we were surprised that the Japanese had basically made every seminal discovery for ghrelin uh, that I actually told you about. For all practical purposes, it, they originated in their lab. We were surprised that they had not reported this enzyme, so we knew it was probably a challenging problem. And if you think about it, it is a challenging problem because if ghrelin is made only in 1% of the cells in the stomach, the enzyme could either be made only in those 1% or it could be a housekeeping enzyme that could be all over the body. So where would one begin? So our, as a biochemist, our first approach was a biochemical approach in which we ground up, we, we scraped off epithelial cells from the stomach and incubated uh, the various fractions, membrane, soluble fraction with radioactive octaneal CoA, looking for the transfer of the octaneal group uh, to, uh, to ghrelin, which we uh, made a recombinant form of, of ghrelin. And actually, we had really success. In fact, it was surprising it was too successful we were able to purify uh, a protein to homogeneity and got the uh, sequence back and it turned out to be meristal transferase. Even though we were using octaneal CoA, meristal transferase discovered by Jeff Gordon many years ago, turns out to be a major enzyme in the, in the stomach. And even though, uh, and the specificity is not absolute. So even though we were using octaneal CoA, we ended up with meristal transferase. So then we said, well, biochemistry won't never work, we have to have an alternative approach. So with the student, Jing Yang, who prior to working on ghrelin, uh, he was working on trying to purify these membrane proteins and the sterol regulatory element pathway that, that Bob alluded to. And, and he was frustrated because there were membrane proteins, it was difficult to purify, 
And he was a smart student, and he said, I'll work on any project you want me to, but I don't want to ever purify another membrane protein. So he said, okay, here's a good problem here, but it's going to be really challenging. And he rose to the challenge. And so he came up with a bioinformatic and expression cloning approach to, uh, to identify the enzyme. So the idea was, the first thing he had to do was actually find an endocrine cell that processed uh, pre-pro-ghrelin when he was transfecting his cell into uh, <coughs> ghrelin. And so there were several endocrine cell lines that he found that, that did this processing. And, uh, and so we used this one of these cell lines and he uh, transfected pre pro -ghrelin. and then as a candidate, uh, he focused on this family of, of membrane-bound OHL transferases. They're called MBOs, and there have been three of these that have been characterized in the literature. The, the, the genome uh, indicated there were 16 of this family, but there were three fairly well-characterized members these are polytopic membrane proteins. The APAT enzyme is an enzyme that transfers a long chain fatty acid <coughs> to acetylene. Usually, where cholesterol has to be a cholesterol to form cholesterol esters. And then the DGAT is an enzyme that transfers to a long chain fatty acid uh, to glycerol to form diacetylglycerol and triglycerides. And then the one that attracted our attention is porcupine. Porcupine is a precursor protein in the WIMP pathway that, that also, uh, which, I'm sorry, WIMP is a secreted uh, protein, and porcupine is the enzyme that's responsible for putting a long chain fatty acid on WIMP, which is essential for its secretion and biologic activity. So this is an example of a secreted protein, much like ghrelin, that had a fatty acid attached to it, even though it wasn't a, a, a octanoate, it was nevertheless told us that this family of proteins could actually uh, work on secreted proteins as well as proteins that were in the cytosol. So, so Jane, uh, with the help of Nick Grisham, a uh, computational biologist in, in Dallas, went through the mouse and the human genome and came up with 16 members of this family. So we cloned by PCR all of the 16 members that are CDNA from uh, the stomach. RNA, and, and then he transfected those, each of those 16 <laughs> cDNAs together with uh, cDNA for pre pro -ghrelin into these endocrine processing cells, and then he made cell extracts, and then he worked out a method in which one could, uh, on the um, reverse phase column, in which one could elute with, with acetonitrile and, <coughs> and the gas acyl ghrelin without optimization in this fraction and the, and the octylated ghrelin would come out of this fraction. You can see, when you look at all 16, only one actually was capable of octylating um, uh, ghrelin. Here are the ones like ACAD and porcupine over here. These were known to him, both one. These right here were totally unknown as to what their functions were. So this looks simple, and, and this turns out to be the right enzyme, but let me just tell you the history for one minute. I think there are a lot of students and postdocs in the audience that would appreciate this. So, so this MBO4, uh, Jen, Jen could never actually uh, get a CDNA based on the information in the genome. It would never PCR. And, uh, and he did these 15, and Mike and I said he should stop the project and let's go on and either think about what we're going to do. Oh, <coughs> sorry. Think about what we were going to do, whether we would take a new approach or whether we would put Jing back to purifying membrane proteins. So, so that thought came to him, too. And so while we were out of town, in fact, I think we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of Dartmouth Medical School at the time, <laughs> Jing uh, decided that he could come up with a cDNA on his own. And to make a long story short, he actually using uh, the information in the genome from all these different species for this particular one, he could not PCR. He got four fragments uh, of DNA. Uh, the whole cDNA was about 1,300 nucleotides. He divided it into four different fragments, had those synthesized, and then he pieced them together by fusion PCR and transfected them into cells, and that's what you see here. But it turns out then, obviously, after he got the right one, then he went back and was able to now PCR 
the real one, the annotation in the genome was totally uh, screwed up. The first two exons were missing and everything, but he was very lucky because even with the first two exons missing with his synthetic cDNA, he was able to get the right enzyme, and then he could go back in PCR and get the, the true one. So this just gives you an example of a persistence and perseverance and the threat of having to go back to work on membrane protein. <laughs> and if he had not done that, we would not be uh, here today giving you this talk. So now let me go on. So much for all the stories. So we were able to show that it was, in fact, the, tr the right protein. This is a hydropathy plot of, of, the, uh, of the encoded cDNA. And from the work on ACAT and DGAT, it was known that these two residues in this family were the catalytic site, so we were able to, to make uh, uh, single amino acid changes in the cDNA and prove that, in fact, it was the enzyme. That was a formal proof that it was the right enzyme. This shows you that the expression uh, of the, uh, the, in fact, we call the enzyme GOAT for, for ghrelin o acyl transferase. The, uh, it, these are thin sections of the stomach, and um, this is a, a immunostain of ghrelin. It shows you it's in about one in a hundred cells, and the uh, riboprobe to stain the goat uh, shows a co-localization. There's a virtually identical co-localization between ghrelin and goat. And when one does the whole survey throughout the body, it's only expressed primarily in the stomach, just like uh, goat. Uh, there's a small amount of expression in the pancreas, just like uh, ghrelin, and there's a small amount in the duodenum, just like ghrelin, but 99% is basically uh, uh, in, the, in the stomach. So the next step in the, in the study was to actually get an in vitro assay. Uh, everything up to now had been done in, uh, in cultured cells with transfection. And so Jing, in order to get an in vitro assay, one had to figure out which form of ghrelin uh, was octanolated, and this shows you the processing of, of pre-progrelin. Uh, it's a 94 amino acid um, protein. The signal sequence is clipped off, and then one has what's called progrelin. And then, uh, and this is the processing that requires uh, uh, the action of an endocrine hormone uh, processing enzyme, prohormone convertase 1, 3. This is the same one that, that converts proinsulin into insulin. And, um, and then you have ghrelin. And what Jing found is that the octanolation occurs at the pro-ghrelin stage. So for an in vitro assay, one may recombinant a pro-ghrelin uh, and then use that in the assay. And so the assay that was, the Jing worked out was to, to infect uh, insect cells with bacillus viruses, vectors encoding uh, the goat cDNA and then take those membranes, and this is a polytopic membrane protein, take those membranes and uh, incubate them uh, with recombinant progrelin that was, uh, that had a histidine tag at the C terminus, and then tritiated octaneal coa in a five minute incubation, and then the reaction mixture is placed over a nickel column, and so that, so any progrelin because of the hist tag that was octanolated would be radio labeled, and that would be counted as scintillation count. It's a very rapid assay, and one has a, a very low blank, and then when one adds the uh, membranes uh, from the cells that have been transfected with goat, you see it goes, activity goes way up, and then this is the catalytically dead, one of those two residues to show that it has no activity. So with this assay, uh, one could begin to look at the, uh, what, what is the enzyme recognizing, what components of which amino acids in GOAT is it recognizing? And we got a clue right away by just looking at the sequence comparison of all vertebrate ghrelins, and you can see that the first seven amino acids are essentially identical in all ghrelins. Interesting, the amphibian bullfrog in the third position does not have a serine, it has a threonine, but it's still oacylated with, with octanoate. So, uh, so the idea, what we decided to do is to do a, like an alanine scan of the first seven amino acids, make uh, progrelin recombinantly and change each amino acid individually to alanine in the first seven positions and then repeat the in vitro assay and see what would happen. And when we did that, this is the wild type activity, changing the first amino acid, knocked out activity, the second one, 
uh, did not, the third one knocked out as you would expect because this is where the octanoid goes. The fourth one knocked out activity, the fifth one, uh, small reduction, but essentially the enzyme seems to be recognizing the first four, the first five amino acids. And, um, and in fact, we confirmed this in the cell-based assay by making cDNAs with each of these different um, alanine change amino acids, and one got exactly the same thing, wild type, one, two, three, four. So it looks like the first four uh, are what's being recognized. And we could then formally show we could make a, either a pentapeptide or a tetrapeptide and show that actually goat octanylated either the pentapeptide or the, or the tetrapeptide with the same affinity and the same kinetics as with, with the whole pre-pro growth. So this gave us, uh, and during the course of, of these enzymatic studies, Jing noticed that the rate of the reaction uh, fell dramatically after about seven or eight minutes. It was linear for the first seven, eight minutes, and then it would drop. So this suggested there may be end product inhibition of the enzyme. The idea would be that as you formed, put the octaneal gro group on uh, progrelin, that octaneal group somehow inhibited the, the catalytic site of the enzyme. And so we were able to test this in the following way. One could make these pentapeptides that had an octaneal group attached covalently, and then add that in the reaction where we're looking for the octanylation of progrelin. You can see that the octaneal pentapeptide inhibits the octanylation of progrelin. And as a control, if we uh, made a palmateal pentapeptide, 16 carbons, it had no effect, and meristol had no effect. So, so this suggested that there may be a peptidomimetic type of approach to uh, designing inhibitors of this enzyme. And so uh, we were able to enhance the inhibitory action of, of that uh, pentapeptide, octaneal pentapeptide I just showed you uh, right here. This is the same curve, essentially the same curve I showed you in the last one. If we made one alteration in the pentapeptide, and that's changing the serine 3 to a diaminopropionic acid, which is basically changing this uh, oxygen here to an amid group. And that enhanced the inhibitory activity uh, by about 45 fold. And then with that clue, we enlisted the collaboration of Patrick Heron, who uh, at the time was a, a uh, chemist in Stephen Knight's department of biochemistry in Dallas. Uh, he's a synthetic chemist and now he's at UCLA, but we've continued to work with Patrick, and he's now designed over 400 uh, pentapeptides, uh, peptinomimetics, uh, similar to the, the DAP that I showed you. And we have several that have nanomolar affin affinity in the in vitro assay, and we have one that works very well in intact cells with an inhibitory uh, KI of about 2.5 micromolar. So we're scaling up uh, this compound right here uh, to do in vivo studies to see what the effect of inhibition of the goat activity is in an adult animal. Uh, to go back to the question is whether it's appetite alone or there is some other function that, um, uh, that ghrelin carries out in the body. So uh, at this stage, uh, I'll now, let, we'll observe a moment of silence to check out blackberries. And um, I'll be happy to take questions now, and then Mike will tell you what happens when one actually does genetic knockouts in goats and uh, mice. Thank you.